All right. Props to everyone who's still here. Really, really appreciate it. But I think that uh, so many people are excited to speak at an event like this. It's definitely a testament to the event itself. So let's give the team of Gross a big round of applause. Thank you very much for hosting this. All right, so we're going to do a deep dive into the optimizations of Wonderland Engine. In 10 minutes, more like a deep scratch of the surface, but uh, I'm, it's a very technical talk, but I'm going to try to make it digestible for everyone here listening. All right, so Wonderland Engine is a game engine that is written from the, from the ground up for the performance char characteristics of the web to bring you very, very close to native performance. It integrates very well with the web ecosystem because of that, and uh, we do some very, very crazy optimizations. So I'm Jonathan Hale, I'm the founder of Wonderland Engine. I wrote the first lines of code. I'm gonna bring this link up later as well. I'd love to get connected to you. Uh, I bu started building Wonderland Engine roughly 2018, and the first publicly available version was 2020. Uh, we got some seed funding and were able to build up an engine team that I get to work with up, up to today. And we released our 1.0, our production ready version in 2023. Now that tells you a bit about what I did, but not who I am. And they say, you know a person when you know their two favorite GLS alts. <laughs> Mine is UNT bits to float, which produces a floating point from a UNT. And the second one are all the bit set operators, which also shows you I don't really accept limitations. And that's also a mindset that we put into the engine where we try to kind of use, squeeze every bit of WebGL and kind of use WebAssembly to get all the performance we can out of the browser and go to very extreme lengths to kind of performance. Okay, let's have a look at what you can do with it. Dead Secret Circle Web is an interesting one because it's a VR game that's published into the MetaQuest store and we kind of rebuilt it from its original Unity implementation in Wonderland Engine to show that it can run in the same frame rate in the MetaQuest browser. Uh, the Escape Artist and most of the biggest WebXR games out there are currently built on Wonderland Engine. We're very proud of it. And by the way, you can do mixed reality in the browser. A lot of people ask me about that. And uh, we're also launching a full scope web game with monetization and everything in 3D, hopefully very, very soon, to show you that it's not just XR that you can do with one dimension. All right, so let's dive into the actual optimizations and how we do this. And to give you an idea of where the talk starts, uh, this is kind of a suggestion of what I say you, you definitely do always. Um, but I'm not going to talk about any of these, and we're not even doing all of these because, for example, frozen cooling, static batching, and multi draw don't really work for us. We found other things that are faster. And there's a big, it needs to be generally applicable and automated. So we don't want people of the game engine having to do all of these optimizations manually. And I think the general mindset that I want to bring to you all is optimize game engines like a native engine developer, not like a native engine. The optimizations you have in native engines are not necessarily applicable to the web. Because one of the biggest bottlenecks we have on the web are draw calls. And to give you an idea of what a draw call is as a refactor, you want to draw a mesh, you call a function. This function gets piped to the browser, browser sends it to the driver, and the driver to the GPU. So there's a little bit of kind of time performance consumption for every step of that. And you'd have to do that for every single mesh that you want to render. And uh, I mean, that works, but if you have a lot of meshes like in the web, uh, the escape artist, I mean, unfortunately you can't instance these because they're using fake lighting on the texture, uh, then you get into trouble. So what we'd actually like to do is more like something like this. We want to kind of combine everything and then just do one single draw. Now, if you do that, you also need to atlas all the textures and also batch all the materials to kind of make that happen. Uh, we combine all the meshes into one big mesh and then add a little ID attribute to be able to still distinguish which vertex data comes from which object to then later use this object ID data to look up the texture, look up the material, 
and also the transformation. So we can still move all the objects dynamically around despite them being all combined into one single huge draw call. That allows us to do tens of thousands of dynamic objects in a single draw call. All of them could be a completely different mesh. Uh, we only have time to look into one of these, but we'll have a look at how the texture atlasing works. So we have to kind of combine all the textures into one to still be able to use it with the mesh patch. Uh, that looks roughly like this. We just define a range, and that range kind of points into one big texture. So what's the big problem here? On Android, unfortunately, the biggest texture size you can use for that is kind of 4K. And overall, 4K seems kind of be the sweet spot. So that gives us kind of a limit of what the biggest texture size can be. I'm, I don't know if we could kind of do texture array layers and just like uh, have up to 2048 textures, that's nice. But that's 137 gigabytes of GPU memory you need there if it's uncompressed. Oh, snap. <laughs> uh, to be fair, because there's browser developers here, Chrome actually not crashes, never crashes because of WebGL. It just does a context loss or uh, give a texture allocation error. All right, so we can maybe just use 128 textures. Could be enough for, for a nice web game. I don't know. That's still 8.5 gigabytes. All right, let's use texture compression, maybe ASTC 4x4 with 8, 8 bits per pixel. That's 2.1. Getting there, ETC1S, four bits per pixel, it's one gigabyte. And uh, you know, I, I didn't find a screenshot for iOS uh, Safari crashing. So a broken screen obviously doesn't break your screen. Neither do Safari tabs crash, but they will usually just reload or hang. So, and what, what if you want to do an AK texture? I mean, and mid maps, I mean, this is all kind of uh, not the right approach. And uh, we solved this by kind of swapping in pieces of textures in and out of memory, that depending on what you currently render in the view. Now, this is something we call texture streaming, and it kind of looks like this. If you have a frosted glass, you have kind of pieces of frosted glass textures in the GPU memory that's visualized down here. And then you have like these tiles that are kind of like swapped in and out of the GPU memory based on what you see. And at this point, I want to give a shout out to the OGs of sparse virtual texture texturing. As far as I know, John Kamark was the first guy to implement that in Rage. Uh, and Sean Barrett did an amazing talk on YouTube that allowed me to understand what was going on. And then uh, Ka Chen did an, another amazing talk at GDC uh, for adaptive virtual texture streaming in Far Cry uh, with Ubisoft. So thanks, guys. Couldn't have done it without you. So what we do is we split up every texture and into same size textures. And that's going into a texture array uh, layer uh, with 260 by 260 ASTC 4x4 compressed tiles. And that works. That's 138 megabytes and plus like a little bit of a indirection texture, as you call it. Uh, so that's amazing. So how do we know what tiles we actually need in a cache? Uh, off request animation frame, we render a second frame where basically the entire scene gets another pass because everything is basically just five toggles or something like that. That's super easy to do. And it renders which tile at which resolution is required for which pixel. <laughs> that is stored into some uh, crazy encoding with some bit packing and then read back into the CPU with some asynchronous readback with like pixel transfers. And what? So uh, that kind of works. And I saw people, a, a couple of you kind of flinch when I said 260 by 260. You might have noticed that it's not power of two. Why is that? That's strange. Well, if you split a texture, for example, into four tiles, let's take a nice picture of a cat, then you will need to read from this texture by also reading the surrounding pixels because you want uh, kind of bilinear filtering, which means uh, otherwise you get like a super pixelated look on your textures, right? Now, what happens if you get to the end? Then you're jumping to the next layer and you don't get hardware filtering or that edge. So you need to do something about that. The way to handle that is that you basically copy a margin and 
copy that onto the text. That's where the kind of extra four pixels come from because you have a four by four kind of block for ASTC four by four compression. You also need to do that on the other end for wrapping because you might kind of like go around with your UVs and have to do that kind of over and over again for like a floor texture or something like that. And then you can even sample corners, which is absolutely wonderful. And you get hardware accelerated uh, linear filtering for that. Uh, and uh, of course, some of you were just thinking like, yeah, show me the cat, so here's the cat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we had a look at uh, textures. Materials is also very interesting and object transforms. We didn't even talk about Sigin. So maybe I'll come back for those. Uh, but uh, let's let's dare the live demo. There we go. Nice. Okay. Preparation. Okay. And I have some nice visualization for you, so you can see the tiles there in colors here. And now, if we move closer to that, can't speak at the same time. That's that's all right. Nice. Uh, you can, well, you cannot see, but there's some like roughness textures and normal textures going on as well. So there's multiple layers of textures that need to be fed back. No, just normal maps. And it also works for skinning. As you can see here, it wouldn't be a game engine if you couldn't also do like other cool things with it, right? All right. <laughs> uh, I think that was four draw balls. And uh, every one of those little uh, ball thingies could have been a separate mesh. All right. So why would someone go through all of this? Well, the web is amazing. It's like low friction. You can easily publish there. You own the IP. It's cross-platform, runs absolutely everywhere. Um, and we want to unlock that for everyone, also games industry. And so it's also because we love the challenge and we really love doing this stuff. And if you don't, then it's also so that you don't have to. And uh, so please license our engine. Uh, you can do it at different levels. You can use the editor, but you can also just use the runtime or maybe use it as like a middleware kind of thing. We're happy to kind of work with you on the render engine. You can just build your editors on call. So I couldn't have done this with the Wonderland, uh, without the Wonderland engine team, which I'm very, very grateful to be able to work with every day. And of course, thank you very much for all the browser devs out there, because I mean, you're doing an insane amount of work. Sometimes you get a little bit of shit for it because People think WebGL is slow, but people are just using it wrong. Here's a, a QR code. Please scan that. And in the meantime, is there any questions? <laughs>